Donc, Marcus Klammer intervient sur les, les films de Guy Debord euh, et sur la notion d'avant-garde de, de, traumatique. Donc, Marcus Klammer est Schaulager, professeur des théories de l'art à le Kunsthistorische Seminar de Bâle, donc à l'Université de Bâle. Euh, Schaulager, professeur aussi, une, pour nous, un lien très intéressant parce que lié à des pratiques aussi de l'art contemporain. Donc, ça, ça j ai, j ai, pour nous, est vraiment un point très intéressant. Et donc, il est directeur adjoint aussi de Icones euh, euh, de NFS Bill Critique, dont nous avons déjà parlé. Donc, il a une formation des de philosophes, d'historiens de l'art et de littérature comparée. Excuse me for speaking in English. Um, first of all, Thank you very much for this very kind invitation to this wonderful conference to Giovanni Carreri, to Bernard Rudiger, and um, to Angela um, Mengoni. Uh, I will uh, talk in the following 45 minutes about Guy Debord's um, last film, the last film he made for the cinema, In Girum Imus Nocte, Et Consumimur uh, Igni. As most of you uh, might know, um, this is a a found footage film, or what in English is called a found footage film. That means the film is composed of fragments of other movies the Boar has stolen, has appropriated, or as uh, it is said in French, détourné. Um, and this film is um, accompanied, this, this, this stolen material um, of the film is accompanied um, by a voiceover commentary um, of Guy Debord himself, a voiceover commentary that is mostly a theoretical and ideological um, commentary on the history of the avant-garde movement of the Situationist International. So um, to get us in sort of a Situationist mood, um, in order uh, to start uh, the talk, I will first show um, a few minutes of the beginning of the film. And in my talk, I will mostly focus on the structure of the title of the film, in Girum Imus Nocte et Consumimur Igni, which is a palindrome. That means a sentence that can be read both from the front and from the back. But first of all, let's take a short look at the beginning of the film. Je ne ferai dans ce film aucune concession au public. Plusieurs excellentes raisons justifient à mes yeux une telle conduite et je vais les dire. Tout d'abord, il est assez notoire que je n'ai nulle part fait de concession aux idées dominantes de mon époque ni à aucun des pouvoirs existants. Par ailleurs, quelle que soit l'époque, rien d'important ne s'est communiqué en ménageant un public fut-il composé des contemporains de Périclès. 
et dans le miroir glacé de l'écran, les spectateurs ne voient présentement rien qui évoque les citoyens respectables d'une démocratie. Voilà bien l'essentiel. Ce public si parfaitement privé de liberté et qui a tout supporté mérite moins que tout autre d'être ménagé. Les manipulateurs de la publicité, avec le cynisme traditionnel de ceux qui savent que les gens sont portés à justifier les affronts dont ils ne se vengent pas, lui annoncent aujourd'hui tranquillement que, quand on aime la vie, on va au cinéma. Mais cette vie et ce cinéma sont également peu de choses, et c'est par là qu'ils sont effectivement échangeables avec indifférence. Le public du cinéma, qui n'a jamais été très bourgeois et qui n'est presque plus populaire, est désormais presque entièrement recruté dans une seule couche sociale, du reste devenue large. Celle des petits agents spécialisés dans les divers emplois de ces services dont le système productif actuel a si impérieusement besoin. Gestion, contrôle, entretien, recherche, enseignement, propagande, amusement et pseudo-critique. C'est là suffisamment dire ce qu'ils sont. Il faut compter aussi, bien sûr, dans ce public qui va encore au cinéma, la même espèce quand, plus jeune, elle n'en est qu'au stade d'un apprentissage sommaire de ses diverses tâches d'encadrement. Au réalisme et aux accomplissements de ce fameux système, on peut déjà connaître les capacités personnelles des exécutants qu'il a formés. Et en effet, ceux-ci se trompent sur tout, et ne peuvent que déraisonner sur des mensonges. You uh, have seen the film starts with sort of a um, sociological analysis of um, the um, audience um, of the cinema. In 1981, Peter Bohr's final film in Guillaume Imus Nock, that Consumer Igne premiered in theaters a good three years after its completion. As often noted, the title of the film is a palindrome. Its author, the author of the palindrome, is thought to be the Gallo Roman bishop and poet Sidonius Apollinaris, who lived around the middle of the fifth century and took part in the confusions that led to the fall of the Western Roman Empire. In Girum Imus Noct at Consumimo Igni, we go in circles at night and are consumed by fire, which is the English translation of the palindrome. This does a textual formation that presents the same sequence of letters, whether one writes it from beginning to end or from end to the beginning. Spoken aloud, the words are the same. Furthermore, the statement of the palindromic title itself seems directly related to its structure. We are going in circles. As Giorgio Agamben has remarked in an essay on the Bohr called Repetition and Stillness, at the very end of the film, the Bohr alludes again to the circular form when instead of uh, the usual fin, the sentence à reprendre depuis le début fades in. The Bohr himself commented on this in 1980. I quote, Le mot reprendre a ici plusieurs sens conjoints dont il faut garder le maximum. D'abord, à relire ou revoir depuis le début, évoquant ainsi la structure circulaire du titre palindrome. Ensuite, à refaire le film ou la vie de l'auteur. Ensuite, à critiquer, corriger, blâmer. In fact, a palindrome is not a cyclical, um, but an inverted structure. It may be read forwards and backwards without modifying the order of the letters. One may also arrange it in a circle, but the nature of the palindrome, in whatever graphic form it is represented, only reveals itself when one changes the direction of reading, when one brushes it against the grain, so to speak. Each palindrome points to an invisible fold, 
an unperceivable axis along which it may be divided in two identical mirror parts. And I'm showing here um, you one uh, of the notes Marcel Duchamp has made for his 1926 uh, film Anemic Cinema. And here you can see this fold or this uh, mirror axis um, Duchamp has just drawn in red um, um, between uh, the two words anemic uh, and, and cinema. And of course, these two words are, um, are mirrored. And also this title uh, of Anemic Cinema by Duchamp is a palindrome, uh, as you can see. What is unusual about the Bohr's title palindrome and what the Gampen and the Bohr himself in his commentary seem to neglect in their fixation on the circle of time is that its two parts compose standalone sentences in Girum Imus Nocte, the first sentence, and Et Consumimu Igni, the second one, which in turn may be read both from the front and from the back and in this process contain one another semantically. In Girum Imus Nocte reads from the back at consumimo igni, while at consumimo igni reads from the back in Girum Imus Nocte. He who goes in circles at night is necessarily consumed by fire, and only he is consumed by fire who goes in circles at night. So the seemingly cyclical progression of the palindrome which one might describe more accurately as a counter-progression, contains within it a double mirroring. Firstly, a syntactical mirroring, dividing and at the same time binding, binding the two main clauses in Girum Imus Nocte and Et Consumum Igni. Secondly, a semantical mirroring. Each of the two clauses read backwards produce the other. The circle promised by the semantic content in Girum Imus Nocte is thus an empty promise. Agamben seems not to have noticed this in his text in proceeding with theories of repetition and return. And De Boer, right at the beginning of the film, we see the title type itself from front and back simultaneously. This is what we've seen in the projection. I've shown you. So we can see uh, the title um, type itself. Each clause occupying its own line of text. The line break between the clauses is used to mark and at the same time to wield the axis of symmetry. Why then does De Boer deny his own procedure in his commentary, alluding instead to the structure circulaire of the title? The sentence, nous tournons en rond dans la nuit et nous sommes dévorés par le feu, is spoken twice more in the film, both times at decisive moments. First, in the first person plural, nous tournons en rond, in connection with that circle of conspiring friends who call themselves situationists. The second time in third person plural, il tourne en rond, in connection with the so-called society of the spectacle. The society of the spectacle being what we today would call a late capitalist consumer society where people only deal with images, with um, alienated representations of things and not with the things themselves. In the first case, the aim is to recall to memory a labyrinthine time without exit, one that is irrevocably past lost in the current of history, but one which was a pinnacle, a point culminant du temps, as de Boer puts it, a moment of highest intensity that contained everything, a situation. A situation similar to St. Augustine's concept of the nunc stans, the standing now or eternal moment. In the second case, de Boer's voice, which glides over the film's images like a ship over water, refers to the circular time of the spectacle. The consumers of the society of the spectacles are themselves consumed by fire. But this time, it is no divine fire, but the fire of the eternal recurrence of the same, a rather infernal fire. No pleasure, however refined, no commodity, however expensive or cheap, is capable of satisfying their desire. 
they burn without burning up. They are themselves consumed in a circuit of consumptions. Both times, an insatiable desire is reported, a fire that cannot be quenched, embodied by the same labyrinthine, multiple folded sentence of the title palindrome. The significance of the fire could not be more different on the two occasions, though. The fire of a mystic love, on the one hand, which for the boy is no longer the love of God, as in Dante's Divina Commedia, to which the film alludes, but rather the love of a clandestine revolutionary group, the situationist avant-garde, and the fire of hell, on the other hand, which no longer consumes sinners, but the entire society of the spectacle without distinction. One and the same phrase, one and the same image, and yet they refer to entirely different things. They are loaded with a double sense. The Boers films, above all La Société du Spectacle, but also Ingirum, are interwoven with private photographs and film material of the Boer, his friends and his wives. On the screen, these traces of a secret life take on the form of the spectacle, becoming indistinguishable from the blown up faces of film stars on the movie screens or the blank expressions of the advertising models used by the Boer. Whereas these faces, in fact, only the ever same, ever different mask of the commodity seem infused with a mysterious bliss, mysterious bliss, I'm sorry. In a passage of Ingirum, the boss voice speaks scornfully of, I quote, cette poussière d'image, of which the film consists. But one should not believe its disdainful tone. It is precisely dust that can be blown away and uh, deposit elsewhere, prone to build up new, unexpected forms. Thus, in a fragment torn from the original context, Détourné, as de Boer says, and inserted into the film in Girum, the fragment of a 1941 film about the unauthorized attack of General Custer on the tribes of the Sioux, Arapaho, and Cheyenne at Little Bighorn River, the Situationists are not figured by the Indians, but by the doomed 7th Cavalry Regiment of General Custer. And de Boer himself is in Ingirum, beside General Custer, Zorro, and Robin Hood, all veritable representatives of Hollywood spectacle, the devil himself, as he appears in The Visiteur du Soir by Marcel Carnet. In a 1956 text on the use of détournement, or diversion as it says in English, the Boer states, I quote, Ils font donc concevoir un stade parodique sérieux où l'accumulation d'éléments détournés s'emploierait à rendre un certain sublime. Now, this half serious, half parodic sublime lies precisely in the indistinctness of life and spectacle, of art and life, of friendship and contempt. In his essay, Légende pour Guy Debord, Servitude et Libération des Images, Emmanuel Burdeau, with reference to the title of Ingirum, speaks of a, I quote, mouvement de giration signifié par le palindrome. According to Burdeau's statement, the palindrome expresses the movements of the film, those of the film strip and the projector as much as those of the persons and objects on screen. Following this train of thought, one could regard the reflection on the turning and winding of the film material through the projector as the distinctive preoccupation of Ingirum. But I would like to argue in a different direction, in the direction of the structure of filmic time, which in itself is organized in a palindromic way. Basically, every film functions as a palindrome. We can read it forwards and backwards. We can let the film rolls rotate in two opposite directions, forward and backward, making ourselves aware of the linear progression of time as well as of the possibility of its reversal. Take, for example, the miraculous repair of destroyed objects 
or the re rejuvenation of film characters when running a film backwards. The messianic, saving, redeeming potential of the celluloid film of pre-digital cinema lies precisely in its potential to run backwards, I would like to argue. In film, the human desire for immortality becomes indistinguishable from the representation of transience. The cinema is a place that preserves the past, locked in the crystals of the film frame. And at the same time, it shows the past as irrevocably past, here and now, presently past, repeatable an arbitrary number of times. In the interweaving of these aspects, film appears as a topological medium that allows the ecstasies of time in Heidegger's sense, present, past, and future, to, to shine through in their paradoxical identity. What takes place on the screen is just as present as it is past. Through the separation of the act of filming and the act of projection, films being pastness becomes a constitutive condition for the fact that it can play again in the here and now of the cinema, that it can always play again. With reference to Stanley um, Kawell, uh, the German film historian Sulgi Lee speaks um, of an, I quote, ontological condition, namely that film as automatic world projection necessarily awakes a past world to life, a world we can never be or could never have been present at apart from the movie itself, end of quote. This fact, I quote again Sulgi Lee, makes the mutual absence of image and spectator irreversible, end of quote. As I've hinted at, the structural being pastness of film is balanced by two different factors without thus being canceled out or being reconciled. Firstly, by the possibility of running backwards and secondly, by the fundamental re repeatability of the time span conserved in the film in the process of projection. The repeatability of film grounds its openness uh, to the future. In a sense, each film is aimed in advance at a future public, always already turning to viewers to come. It marks cinema as a utopian place. The filming gear room reacts to two fundamental losses. Firstly, to the loss of an epoch that in 1978, on the year the film was made, seemed irrevocably over. An epoch that might be roughly bounded by the years 1950 and 1970. It is the time of the avant-garde mu movements founded by Guy Debord, the letterist and the situationist international. The second loss is that of the friends and comrades associated with this epoch, their meetings and plans, the common goal of the revolution of all social conditions. After the dissolution of the Situationist International in 1972, De Boer, frail and increasingly plagued by his alcoholism, sees himself as the survivor of an excess and of a battle. Like the family members in Pier Paolo Pasolini's film Teorema, the boar is faced with the problem of continued life after the culminating point of time, after the perishing of the Situationist International. In Girum confronts that problem of survival by constructing a paranoiac, self-enclosed filmic subjectivity, as I would like to argue. The conceptual difference between the end of the early Situationist era film Critique de la Separation from 1961 and Ingirum may illustrate this point. Critique de la Separation still propagates a radically open, revolutionary form of the filmic. A quote uh, from the film Toute expression arti artistique cohérente exprime déjà la cohérence du passé, la passivité. Um, and the voice track spoken by De Boer himself ends with the sentence, je commence à peine à vous faire comprendre que je ne veux pas jouer ce jeu-là. At the end of uh, the film Critique de la Separation, the sentence is projected à suivre. This seems to be saying, in that I, 
I'm speaking now for the ball, have the film end abru 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 abruptly, I'm beginning no longer to take part in this game of art. Film and its procedures are only significant to me in so far as they can count as examples of a revolution capable of gripping and transforming the whole of our life and the whole of our perception. The end title, As Vivre, then means you, sh you should follow my example and the example given by this film, but not within the confines of art, within the confines of this film, but rather in that you become active yourselves, changing your perceptions and your environment. A similar sentence appears at the end of Ingirum. This one reads, à reprendre depuis le début. The expression seems to allude to musical no notation which, with the Italian words da capo, demands the repetition of a segment of music. Here, the film itself is supposed to be repeated. Its end should join itself to its beginning so that an infinite loop is formed, folding back on itself, removed from historical time. This loop does not so much repeat as it suspends time, causes time to freeze in the spatially closed structure of the body of the film strip. Like no other film by Debord, in Girum is a dialectical self-portrait, authentic and faked, genuine and ungenuine at the same time. It presents Debord not only in the form of his voice and the photographs that show him at various ages, but also in the allegorical guise of all the Hollywood heroes who appear in the film, as we have already heard, from Robin Hood to General Custer to Zorro. The flat, distanced narrator's voice of the Boers calls in Girum a film qui me prise cette poussière d'image qui le compose. But the dust of images keeps showing the Boer's own countenance. Thus, near the end of the film, the last self-portrait of Rembrandt appears as the culminating point of a series of photographic portraits of the Boer himself, while the Boer's voice denounces the great works of art. As I've stated, the half palindromes of the film title, In Girum Imus Nocte and Et Consumum Igni, carry in the order of the letters a second invisible sense which is only readable in reading backwards. In Girum Imus Nocte always already means Et Consumum Igni and vice versa. In this sense, the Bohr's method of self-portraiture or self-mirroring in the inauthentic is palindromic. The intimacy of the author-subject de Bohr is folded into the palindrome as the both necessary and redeeming other side of the alien, the false, the reified, with the goal of preserving it from the universal equivalence machinery of the spectacle. This procedure recalls the methodological cunning of the dialectics of the Enlightenment of uh, Theodor Adorno and Max Horkheimer. As they make clear, the battle against the brutal dialectic of human existence can only be fought with the means of dialectic itself. The only escape lies in the radicalization of this dialectic. For Adorno and Horkheimer, as much as for De Boer, the right unalienated life has to be conceived as the radicalization of the wrong life, the becoming indistinguishable of the two lives. The Boer mirrors himself not only in the timeless, eternally living heroes of spectacular Hollywood cinema, but also in the photographs of his friends from the times of the letterist and situationist international, who keep reappearing in the film without commentary and without being named. François Begaudot has called the Boer's late film a tombeau pour l'amitié. I think that is um, not exactly right. In Girum features the Boer as this grave, the Boer himself as this grave. Those friendships are over. The conditions under which they were made no longer hold. Some friends are dead, like Oscar Jorn. Others have uh, become insane, like Gilles Liver and the situationist avant-garde has suffered shipwreck. But the survivor de Boer preserves the past times and dead friendships in his memory and enshrines them in the film in Girum. Not indeed as they were, but as de Boer remembers them 
and as he wishes to preserve them. And Jerome's filmic memory is of a paranoiac, totalitarian structure that bends back on itself just as the end of the film bends back on its beginning. A totality that makes the friends and past moments of friendship appear as mere functions of the immanence of the boy's own absolute memory. In contrast to Pasolini, who in Theorema sets the problem of survival after the culminating point of history in a eschatological context and finds utopian refuge for the survivors in the Christian tradition of the past and in the peasant rituals of the simple people, the Boers procedure is deeply pessimistic. The whole of the past, which must be saved, is contracted to the person of the survivor who literally embodies it. Under the seal of the palindrome, the Bordian autobiography and filmic structure merge into a traumatic subjectivity incorporated in the film in Girum. According to the rules of the palindrome, the ide identification of self and film is pronounced not implicitly, but explicitly. I quote from the soundtrack. En si donc, au lieu d'ajouter un film à des milliers de films quelconques, je préfère exposer ici pourquoi je ne ferai rien de tel. Ceci revient à remplacer les aventures futiles que compte le cinéma par l'examen d'un sujet important, moi-même. The identification of self and film does not, however, refer only to the film content, but also to its structure, just as the palindrome does not simply deliver a model in terms of content, so saying we go at uh, night in circles and are consumed by fire, but rather sets into motion a play between cyclic message and folded structure. Let us call to mind that the title palindrome of Ingerum is in fact redundant or folded in a double sense. On the one hand, the full sense of the whole palindrome lies folded already in each of the half palindromes in Girum Imus Nocte and Et Consumimo Igni. We go at, circle, at night in circles for the initiated, for those who know to read, and that means in this context for those who know to read backwards, always already means we are consumed by fire and vice versa. On the other hand, in the complete title palindrome, the implicit sense folded into each half palindrome is being made explicit, clear, and obvious to everyone, and no longer just to the initiated. In Girum Imus Nocte et Consumimo Igni, the title palindrome shows what it hides. The two half palindromes are not only folded into one another, they are also folded out in mirror symmetry beside one another. The Bohr's palindrome does not fulfill its basic function of keeping a hidden meaning, of keeping a secret, but rather it openly exposes the secret to view. One might argue that there is no secret after all here, no clandestine community of friends to be protected by secrecy, and indeed there no longer is. The secret, which was hidden like a treasure in the depths of the Bohr's memory, now lies spread out on the surface of the film. The secret is this film. It coexists with the film's publicity and vanishes in plain view like the purloined letter of Edgar Allan Poe. Public visibility assimilates the secret just as the Boer assimilates the lost friendships and shares pa shared pasts in his memory. What began as an outbreak from art to experimental forms of social life ends after the dissolution and atomization of the collected efforts, again, as art in a monumental work like Ingirum. Under the conditions of the spectaculaire intégré, the saving of a secret life, which for the situation is always meant a life beyond the grand structures that regulate communication and commerce in a capitalist society, can only be had at the price of total self-reference. It is in this sense that we must understand the third meaning given by the Bohr to the final title, A Reprendre depuis le début, in his commentary to Ingirum. To critique, to correct, to blame. The correcting authority, authority is the film itself. It corrects itself in its repetitions. The repetitions are identical 
for there is no, nothing particular to correct. In Girum is its own public. In January 1979, De Boer wrote in the foreword to the fourth Italian edition of La Société du Spectacle, I quote in English. In 1967, I wanted the Situationist International to possess a theoretical book. The VSI was at that time the extremist group that had done the most to bring back revolutionary questioning in modern society. And it was obvious that this group, which, which had already claimed victory on the terrain of theoretical critique and that continued it skillfully on that of practical agitation, was approaching the culminating point of its action. A few years later, the Situationist International disbanded. In April 1972, the Boer's house publisher, Jean Libre, published the corresponding manifesto, La Veritable Scission dans l'Internationale, co-authored by De Boer and the last remaining member beside himself, Gianfranco Sanguinetti. The culminating point of its action, as De Boer writes retrospectively of the Situationist International in third person singular, May 1968, proved at the same time the beginning of the end. The Situationist International had survived the realistic possibility of the realization of its revolutionary plans in society as a whole only by a little. And it even seems that it was not made to survive from the beginning. A commentary of the Boer from Ingerum points in this direction, which refers to the politically decisive battles towards the end of the 1960s. I quote, and this is again from uh, the film soundtrack, Le principal résultat a écouté ceux qui ont l'air de regretter que la bataille ait été livrée sans les attendre. On pourrait croire que c'est le fait qu'une avant-garde sacrifiée est complètement fondue dans ce choc. Je trouve qu'elle était faite pour cela. Les avant-gardes n'ont qu'un temps. There is, in the Boer, an ethos of the small group. In the 1956 text, Théorie de la dérive, he writes concerning that planlessly planned wandering which is able to bring about new utopian situations in the old familiar body of the city. I quote, On peut dériver seul, mais tout indique que la répartition numérique la plus fructueuse consiste en plusieurs petits groupes de deux ou trois personnes. For the Boer, isolation from the society of the spectacle with its smooth circulation of commodities, images, and desires is an essential condition for the experimentation with diverging forms of life. The core of the avant-garde group lends the individual revolutionary a communitarian support. If not literally a core in the military sense, it is nevertheless to be seen as collective corpus or body. As such, it fulfills the task of imaginatively multiplying and multiplying and enlarging the body of the individual revolutionary, protecting it, camouflaging, and strengthening it. On the other hand, it functions as a supplement for society as a whole, so that the effects of the avant-garde on itself can also always be interpreted as effects on society, or at least as preparations for such. A good tea deal of the utopian power of the avant-garde lies in this concentration of energies in small um, units, which try, um, which try out and at the same time defer the revolution of society as a whole. In the period after the dissolution of the Situationist International in 1972, the subject the Boer's loss of the core of the Situationist International had to be compensated. The Boer begins to stylize himself as a survivor of a great catastrophe, namely the death of the avant-garde. A survivor who not only preserves in memory the vanished past and the lost companions, but literally incorporates them. Elias Canetti describes a comparable uh, process of incorporation in the last chapter of Mass et Puissance, a book conceived somewhat parallel to and in competition with Sigmund Freud's 
psychoanalytic remarks on an autobiographically described case of paranoia. As Freud, Canetti makes use of the famous autobiographical notes of the Saxon judge Daniel Paul Schreber, published in 1903, as a paradigm for the paranoid forms of authority. Schreber's paranoia, according to Canetti, is based on the, I quote, feeling of the catastrophic. Canetti says, quote, all mankind had perished. Schreber thought himself the last remaining real human. The real humans had all perished. The only one who lived was himself, end of quote. Schreber acts as the magnet and the reservoir of a threatened collectivity, namely the totality of dead souls. Quote again from Canetti from Masse und Macht. The great man swallows them. They enter him literally only to disappear. His effect on them is destructive. He draws them and collects them. He makes them small and consumes them. All they bear benefits only his own body. Every paranoid is always also the ruler of a people. A people, of course, that is missing. He himself functions as the unity of this people, which, gather, which he gathers in himself and which serve as material for the play of his totalizing powers. For De Boer, this people is constituted by the perished avant-garde of the Situationist International. In works like Ingirum, the soft mortal body of the man De Boer is supplemented by something that could be called De Boer in quotation marks. In Girum is not only about the boar, it is also the boar himself to a certain extent. The subject, the boar, takes on the body of the work. He becomes the work in order to resist spectacle and outlast the times. I'm coming to the end. In Girum is obsessed with the melancholic awareness of the unstoppable flow of time and the impossibility of bringing back its culminating moments, but also with the desire of holding on to everything that was, of making irreversible time repeatable for all time. As I've stated earlier, it is the, film, the filmic dispositive that offers the possibility in a certain sense of having time at one's command. And indeed, the end of Ingirum, à reprendre le, le début, which points back to its own beginning, makes use of this possibility in the mimesis of the cyclical structure of time. The paranoid structure of the film subject in Girom, the Boer, corresponds to this cyclical closure of filmic time. The whole time span of the film is filled almost from the first to the last second with the Boer's own voice, as if the film images lend the Boer's cool monotone, indifferently gliding voice, a glossy, smooth, visible black and white body. In September 1998, Martin Baraquet, the editor of the Boer's previous film, La Société du Spectacle, talked to Christophe Bourseillet about the film's peculiar soundtrack, which too consists in a voiceover commentary by De Boer. Bourseillet remarks, Le commentaire de Guy De Boer a été enregistré chez lui dans des conditions non professionnelles. Martin Baraquet s'emploie à nettoyer la bande, à couper les nombreux allaitements, sifflements et bruits divers qui, qui ponctuent le phrasé d'un buveur que les excès ont déjà fatigué. Five years later, the boss' state of health has become even worse. He suffers from gout, he can only walk with a cane. But the voice of Ingirum too permits none of this to be heard. With Michel Chillon, this voice may be termed an echosmatic voice. It is a voice that cannot be attributed to any figure visible in the filmic field. Rather, it is a freely floating voice which is always already uncoupled from a living speaker. It is a voice without a human body. The purification and liberation of this voice from all creaturely noises, coughing, panting, hissing, rattling, gives it a somewhat transcendent status. It seems to speak from a space devoid of age, affect, and time. This voice is without instrument. No mortal body brings it forth. No specks and ambient noises 
personalize it. It is the indifferent voice of the film itself. In a note, Pour l'ingénieur du son, Debord writes, a note uh, written um, for the post-production of Ngiru, I quote, Il faut égaliser partout à la même hauteur les phrases du commentaire et autant que possible faire de même à l'intérieur de chacune des phrases. On ne recherche aucun effet oratoire en élevant la voix sur certains mots. Il s'agit d'obtenir un discours monotone et froid, un peu lentement, tout en restant évidemment audible. One can almost state, the more fragile the boar's own body gets, the more perfect becomes its self-representation, um, its acoustic self-representation in film, or rather, as film. La sensation de l'écoulement du temps a toujours été pour moi très vive et j'ai été attiré par elle comme d'autres sont attirés par le vide ou par l'eau, says the voice of Ingerum. From this viewpoint of identifying the passage of time with the flowing and draining of water, Ingerum reveals itself as an elementary allegory of cinema. It is composed of water and fire, while the constant fire of the projection beam consumes the film frame by frame, marking the culminating point of time, the movement of the film roll in the night of the cinema hall makes visible the continuous stream of images, the passage of time. In Girum Imus Noctet Consum Me Igni, what speaks here are the film images themselves, ephemeral mechanized moths that go on a circular way to the fire night after night. Thanks very much for your attention. <laughs>